Okay, this lecture is a video about the life of a doctor, and the point of it is to help doctors themselves to you know, be efficient with their time in a way that they're going to be happy with, and it's also to help other people that are curious to understand a doctor for what that's worth. Um, the family context or some life event typically makes a person want to become a doctor. And I can tell you, doctors, you know, they start out med school with good intentions, and most of them really are pretty nice and really want to help their patients. Um, a doctor's life is very academic, especially it really begins first year of college and school dominates their life. The pre-med curriculum just keeps them very busy with science classes. You know, a three-unit science class is about six units or seven units of humanities classes. Um, and the stuff that they study is very uh, sort of academically challenging. A lot of it is what you would call a weed-out class. Typical college will have um, hundreds and hundreds of students in their first and second year uh, biology pre-med major type classes and then very few relatively speaking in their uh, junior and senior classes because they've all been weeded out. Uh, I remember when I was at Stanford probably only out of my freshman dorm 12 pre-meds and only four of them ended up going to med school um, and I always thought that was kind of uh, you know sad or a joke in some ways because you know, if they had gone to some easier school, they probably would have got in if that's what they really wanted. They might have learned, too, that they don't want to. But anyways, <clears throat> the most of the classes in the pre-med curriculum are irrelevant to being a doctor. Like, in my opinion, they shouldn't have to take mathematics, calculus, and statistics. I think they're a waste of time. And the reason I say that is I'm a high-tech doctor, board certified in three fields, about as high-tech as it gets, and I never use any math. The only math I use, I already knew it in about fourth grade, you know, addition, subtraction, multiplication, whoop de doo um, Physics, waste of time. You know, I'm a radiologist. I had to learn the physics, but the physics of radiology is just a big joke. It's, it's a cakewalk. I didn't really need any of my background in physics for it. Um, physical chemistry, organic chemistry. I mean, yeah, you need to know organic chemistry structures, but you could learn what you need to know in about two weeks. You don't need a full year of it. Uh, laboratory chemistry is just like smelling paint. That doesn't help you with anything. The reason I mention all these classes and say they're irrelevant is that doctors don't know basic nutrition, basic toxicology and a lot of basic pathophysiology. They spend so much time doing all this other stuff that's not gonna affect patient care at all. Um, so what ends up happening is if they wanna learn this stuff, they have to do it on their own. And they really don't have a lot of free time for learning, as surprising as that may sound, it's true. Um, I'm gonna talk about a workaround for that, but I'm trying to help explain how a doctor ends up being the way they are. Then it's a real challenge to get into med school. You gotta take MCATs, and, you know, what could be useful to them in, in college? Try to take anatomy, physiology, histology, biochemistry. Um, I remember my first, like, midterms of med school. I had gotten, like, 10 percentile on the class, and I couldn't believe it. I was so pissed off. I'm like, I've given up my life, and I'm 10 percentile? No way. I was, like, freaked out. Like, I had been beaten up or something. I was so pissed off and surprised by it. And then what I realized, I'm sitting at the cafeteria table and all these med students at University of Illinois are like, oh, well, you know, I took, you know, senior year, I took anatomy, physiology, histology. And I'm like, oh, there's the answer. They'd had all the classes before. Once I realized that, then I did better. I always expected to be the best student in the class. So I was, for me, being 10 percentile was like a major, major problem for me. Um, so med school, second year. Pathology was the best class. And then you start being taught by doctors and persons involved in patient care, and it's a lot more interesting. First year, it's almost like they, they take the PhDs no longer capable of doing research, ready to be put out the pasture and have them teach. And the teaching first year is really bad. Um, I, I tutored a first year medical student a couple years ago, and his first class was learning the, in anatomy was learning the small muscles of the back. You know, they're totally irrelevant. I, I specialize, I used to run a pain management clinic and I didn't need to know the little uh, anatomical detail that a first year med school student was taught. It was a waste of time. Okay, um, boards they take at the end of the second year and that used to be the most important thing. They're trying to sort of dial it down, but that used to be the key uh, deciding factor how well somebody did on boards if they can get into a competitive residency. Uh, but medical students study far more than college students do. A lot of it is academic endurance and 
they all do it. They all have to do it. That's just the way it is. Um, third and fourth year, you do clerkships, and that's more fun. You start to learn how to help patients and see patients. Um, and residency starts typically when they're about 26 years of age after four years of medical school to get the doctorate. Residency has a lot of humiliations because you're always new person on the block. You're low man on the totem pole. There's a very strict hierarchy from junior resident, intern to junior resident to senior resident to fellow to junior attending to senior attending, etc. And you always have to respect the hierarchy. And you get to do all the kind of lousy jobs so the more junior you are. And a lot of the patients, people, you know, people always think of themselves. Like somebody watching this video is probably a college-educated, high IQ person, okay? But the people sick in hospitals very often, they're really people who've had a rough life. Lots of alcoholics, drug addicts, cognitively impaired people. So you spend a lot of time. It's not like it's some glamorous job where you're taking care of Hollywood celebrities. No, it's really sad, miserable stuff, really sick, sad, unfortunate people. And you do what you can to help them, and you learn as you go along. But it's not, it's not like it's some wonderful, fun thing like you see in some TV show and there's, you know, some hot nurse who wants to go out with you. Yeah, you know, all that kind of stuff on TV show. It's not like that, at least not very much hardly at all. Um, a lot of residents do fellowship afterwards. And they're, again, they're really working long and hard hours. Around this time, they'll often they'll start looking for a wife. Plus, for a guy, you know, a lot of pre-meds don't even get laid in college. And then the further along they go, the more potential they have to make money and the more women take an interest in them. Um, let's see. Uh, then when they get their first job, they want to try to make partner and now they're like, wow, gee, it's about time to have a baby. They'll often have a baby. They're working like crazy because they don't make partner. They could lose their job. Partner, let's say, in a private practice group. So working very long hours. If they're a junior attending in an academic place, they want to get promoted to become a full professor. And so they tend to be workaholics in those young years. Then once they have a baby, they're up, night, up at night helping take care of the baby, not sleeping a lot. Then once they got the baby, they want to get one of the mother-in-laws, mothers, grandmothers to help take care of the baby. They want better schools in the suburbs, bigger yard for the kid, move to the suburbs. Now they typically have a long commute because most hospitals are in the big cities. So they're driving in the big cities. So now they're working long hours. They have a long commute. They're up at night taking care of the baby. So they don't really have a lot of time to be ongoing learning or studying. And that's relevant because it'll turn out there's major big gaps in their educations. And the only way they can fill those gaps is if they read on their own and they usually don't have much time to read. Um, CME, one doesn't really need to learn anything. For most CME, you can just sign an attendance sheet and then run around, you know, let's say in some vacation place. Or even if you do it online, the questions are pretty easy. And most of the lectures are the same old thing and they're stupid. For example, I'm a neuroradiologist, one of the main things that I do. And the brain lectures, I could tell you what the lectures are going to be before I even show up. And they say the same stupid stuff all the time. And it's like a home run job where the, the lecturers tend to be the same people all the time. And they never, hardly ever say anything original or interesting. Now, don't get me wrong. There's some great CME lecturers. But they're few and far between. And it's weird, but they tend to not get invited very much to these CME conferences. You know, there's there's like genius level guys like Thomas Nadich, who I love to hear him talk when he talks about this complex, detailed anatomy of the brain. But that's not what you hear at most CME. It's just garden variety stuff I've heard a bazillion times. I knew it my first year or second year of residency. Okay, anyways, um, and uh, but I'm making a point because I'm trying to explain something about why doctors are the way they are and why medicine is the way it is. And this is a big part of it. The doctor is exhausted. He's overworked. He doesn't have much time to read. He's under tons of pressure to make money for his group. And the reward for a doctor comes from quantity. The faster you go, the more patients you see, the more hours you bill for, the more money your group can make, the happier everyone is with you. There's no incentive to read. You know, and there's no incentive to change anything because if you change something and do something a new way, that's not the standard of care. You don't get paid for it. And what I've seen in my personal experience, a lot of doctors, they stop reading on their own, either for pleasure or for ongoing learning. They're just too tired and don't have enough time. And the problem is if a person stops reading, they don't learn it that much. 
and they, they sort of kind of level off in their learning rather than keep going up and up, which is what you'd ideally like. And some people say, well, I don't need to learn, learn anymore. I, I learned everything in residency, med school and residency. But that's probably not true because you don't learn nutrition, diet. You don't learn nutritional biochemistry. You don't learn a lot of pathophysiology. You don't learn toxicology in med school and residency. And that's actually what causes most diseases. So if you don't keep learning, I guarantee, you know, because I've looked at the standard textbooks, you don't learn almost any of this in med school. And in most residency programs, you don't learn it. And I know docs. I talk to docs all the time. I know what they know and what they don't know. Um, and I can assure you, if they really want to get a good handle on these diseases, they have to do a ton of reading and studying on an ongoing basis once they're done with residency. And, you know, all doctors are hard workers. They couldn't get through school, residency, and keep their job if they weren't hard workers. People would be pissed off at them if they weren't doing their share of the work. But what I have seen, and a lot of people, it's kind of the opposite of what a lot of people think. A lot of people think, oh, my doctor is so smart and knowledgeable. Hey, your doctor is probably a nice person and a very hard worker with a high IQ. But many of them lack the intrinsic curiosity to keep on reading. And that's what they need to do if they want to really understand these diseases. And it's also the case, plenty of doctors have told me, what's the point? The patients don't want to learn. They don't want to change their diets. They don't want to change their behavior. You just give them a pill, the patient's happy, you get paid, and that's it. And that's actually true for, that's how most patients are. But there is a percentage of patients that really would be willing to change their behavior, would be, would be willing to learn nutrition and avoid uh, a lot of these common environmental toxins that are avoidable. So what I'm saying is real continued education is something the individual does on their own time. Doctors are nice. They want to help their patients. They genuinely do. I talk to them all the time, and I get that feeling all the time. But it is also true because of the ignorance of some doctors in some fields especially. They will just follow the conventional status quo and do some really stupid stuff. Like I've been studying, you know, I've been, what I'm really interested in is what causes a brain neuron to function optimally, what causes a brain neuron to die. And I've read some of the psychiatry and neuropsychopharmacology, and it's, gosh, there's a lot of stupid, ignorant stuff in psychiatry. It's like, holy crap, it's maybe one of the stupidest fields in all of medicine. I can't believe it once I start reading it. And I knew my father was a psychiatrist. My father was a good guy. He wanted to help his patients. He did the best he could. His patients liked him. Um, and I could tell you, he, had, he saw patients in the house. Um, sometimes if a patient was sick, real sick, and the family had problems, the kids would live at our house, and a lot of doctors would send their, their family members to my father to be seen. And my dad was a good guy. When I was young, I looked up to him very much. He was an excellent role model. Um, I uh, wanted to be able to intellectually have a serious debates and arguments with my father and his friends and, you know, my uncle and stuff. And so, you know, and I came up from a very intense academic environment, you know, Stanford undergrad, and then med school and my fellowship at Harvard. So here's what it was like. There were three fellows. One of the fellows committed suicide. It was a very unfriendly environment. We were the imaging guided surgery, really interventional radiology is what it's called. But we were taking over a lot of the angioplasty stenting procedures from the vascular surgeons. So they hated us. And because they hated us, we had to present in a joint conference with them. And um, it was once a week. Uh, one of the fellows had committed suicide, so she could no longer do it. The other fellow didn't speak English so well and did not like being in the hot seat. The attendings refused to present the conference, said it's the fellow's job. So I would present almost every single week, and I would know before I walk into the room, i got to present vascular cases in front of three Harvard vascular surgeons who hate my guts because I'm an interventional radiologist and who will try to catch me making a mistake and humiliate me. I read all their journals. I went through all their VHS courses. There was VHS at that time instead of DVDs. Um, I went to surgical assistant training courses in vascular surgery, everything to be ready for that big day when I talked to them. And I kind of liked the challenge because I knew it was an opportunity to get good. But what I'm trying to say is I came from that environment. Then when I got back and I was in my 30s and I would talk with my dad and his friends, I was just so intense beyond their level. Um, they really couldn't hold an argument with me, and I almost felt sorry for them. Um, but a reason I go through that is because a lot of stupid stuff happens to psychiatric patients because these doctors have not read the literature on neuropsychopharmacology and electroconvulsive therapy. And, you know, it's important they know that, okay? So 
That's why sometimes a nice person can make a big mistake is because they're totally ignorant on certain things, okay? Because I was kind of shocked by reading some of the psychiatry literature, psychiatry history. Man, was it a mess. Okay, um, let's see, what else? Okay, so the system kind of dominates. An individual can have good intentions, but it's pretty difficult for an individual to learn and behave in a way that's not pushed by the system, rewarded by the system. It's a struggle to maintain a creative, thoughtful mind. Okay, now I'm going to give some suggestions on things that could help. And I'm going to talk about the magic bathroom. Okay, the magic bathroom. This is a bathroom in my house. This was from when I was studying for neuroradiology boards. I did a fellowship in neuroradiology as well. I would cut these pictures out of journals and books and put them on my wall and just memorize them. Because you go in the bathroom so many times every day. I counted it. It was like I couldn't believe how many times I go into the bathroom, you know, for numerous things, whatever. Stay well hydrated, you'll go in the bathroom more often, okay? The magic bathroom, I called it. Mozart had written a letter uh, while he's on a toilet and said, I think it's only fitting to write while shitting. And so I said, well, it's only fitting to read. Um, and I saw the Monty Python skit, every sperm is sacred. And I got the idea, every void is sacred. So I'd always have a paperback to read during number ones. Um, and anyways, the reason I'm showing this is you have to go in the bathroom a whole bunch of times every day. If you just listen to an audiobook in the car every day or a podcast and then you listen to and then you read in the bathroom every time you go in that bathroom, I'll read a minimum of one page, quite often quite a bit more than that. I, I get through at least a complete book every week, sometimes a lot more than that. Um, and this is how we do it. You just make yourself read at least a page every time you go in that bathroom. You'll be amazed at how much you could read. Um, let's see what else. I'll put some heroes on the wall that inspire me. Um, and that's that. Okay, so here's like a typical thing, you know, in my current bathroom. I'll have always a textbook to read during a number two. Something difficult that you otherwise would wheeze a lot of doing. Um, here's a paperback. That's the Foxcatcher movie of Mark Schultz, The Wrestler. Great, um, great story. The book's way better than the movie. Um, and then here's just an example. I'll put a little table in there. I can look at a flashcard. I'll have an audio book I can listen to if I'm flossing my teeth or something. Um, I learned a ton of stuff with just this going through the bathroom each day. Uh, one last little thing that can help is, you know, you want to get some exercise. I'll just walk around and I'll read a book. And so all these little habits enable me to keep on learning, keep on learning, keep on learning. And it's nice to keep on learning. It gives you a satisfaction because life kind of beats you down. It says, shut up. You're just a factory worker. Get your numbers for the day. Keep your mouth shut. And, you know, you're just in this field. Therefore, you shouldn't know this other field. But it's sort of like maintaining your mind through ongoing reading, through ongoing conversations with other people with similar interests that are, you know, care about the details of something it makes life a lot more interesting. You gotta work your butt off. There's no escape from that. But if you at least see yourself improving a little bit every day, it makes you happier because the mind never stays the same. If you're not improving, then you're declining. You don't want to turn into an old Gomer doc. That means an old clueless doc who doesn't know what's going on is out of date. So, anyways, I hope this helps. It can help an individual be a better doctor, and it helps explain why doctors are the way they are. I hope it helps.